<clears throat> the following interview was conducted with William Bill Badinger, Special Assistant to the Vice President for Research for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, February the 17th, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, Bill. Good afternoon to you. <laughs> Good Thank to you. be here, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and tell us where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. Uh, Bill Badinger. I was born in Richmond Hill, New York, which is in Queens. Uh, my parents were George and Mildred Badinger. And I have uh, two other siblings, a younger sister, four years younger, Arlene, and an older brother, two years older, George. Uh, how about the early years grade school and then we'll talk a little about high school? Uh, typical New York City grade school. Uh, when I went to school, PS 99, public school. In Manhattan? In Queens. In Queens. Public school 99, which is still there. I went back and visited about three or four years ago. Still going? Fence is still there. Bricks are still there. It's same, same place. Looks like it probably hasn't been much done to it. I think they changed the windows. Uh, went there uh, grades one through eight. Don't have a lot of recollection, only one or two teachers that I were, would remember. Don't even remember what kind of student okay. I was, but obviously I graduated. Right. And, and then you, what, what came next, high school? Then? Sent me off to high school, Where'd public, uh, uh, that's a public school in New York, Forest Hills High School. It was the next neighborhood over. Uh, good school, good academic school. Um, I was not the best student in the world, probably C plus maybe. Don't don't even remember. I was more interested in other things uh, like student activities or athletics. Uh, or no, we or really didn't have a lot of stu the, if public schools in a large city. Once school is out, pst, they all disappear. Everybody disappears, and it's. I don't ever remember having a. Don't ever remember going to a prom or a party. Just didn't have them in those days. And uh, I was manager of the basketball team, spent a lot of time there, and was involved in gym and athletics and uh, tumbling teams and whatnot. But uh, probably didn't get the best education in the world. It was there, but I wasn't, I wasn't smart sure. enough. Did you, was it close to where you lived, or how did you, did you take it? It was a bus or? ride. Uh, oh, okay. It was a walk of about 12 blocks and then a bus ride of 20 minutes. Yeah. How large was your class? High school was 2,000 for four years, so it must have been uh, 500. Okay. And then what, uh, after you, what did, where did you matriculate after that? Well, what, what, the, what uh, came next? It, yeah, it's kind of interesting. We didn't, I've actually been talking to my brother recently. We're trying to figure out how we, how we made it through our early years because you don't have much of a recollection. And, Trying to put the heads together. Yeah, we, we finally decided a couple of things. Uh, uh, my dad never went to, I don't think he ever went to high school. Although people didn't talk about those things and I really don't have any record of it. They never said any about their education. No, I just, I, and I suspect he probably got through grade school because he could read and write, but not, not very sophisticated beyond that. My mom probably got through high school. Uh, but we didn't know anything about college. So I remember when we were, one day my dad came home and he said, we're going over to New York uh, on Saturday. I'm going to see a man about college. And we had never talked about college, so I didn't, hadn't given any thought to it and didn't even really think about it. At any rate, went over to a room someplace on probably 5th or 6th Avenue, 20 stories up, went into a room about that big. And uh, I looked up and on the shelves there were catalogs all around the room. Obviously a recruiter, I didn't know there were such things. I told him what I was interested in. I thought I was interested in, in engineering. Don't have any idea why, because I didn't know what an engineer was or what they did. At any rate, he walked around the whole So your office. father's or the recruiter or somebody? Re recruiter. And he, after about 20 minutes, he walked around, pulled a catalog off of there, which I could see to this day. It was gray with blue on it, which were the school colors, as it turned out. So that was Marietta College catalog, Marietta, Ohio. Small liberal arts school on the Ohio and the Muskingum River where they come together and join. So my brother and I borrowed dad's car during the summer and drove out there. And I looked at it and obviously it was a 
At that time, Marietta was probably a town of six or 7,000, I would guess, and you could walk from one side to the other in about 20 minutes. And I'd grown up in New York City and been all over the city. And that's, I thought the rest of the world looked like that, but once you get west of the Hudson River, it's a little bit different. Right. I know. So at any rate, I looked that over and I wasn't smart enough to know what to look for. It looked like, you know, looked like I could operate there. And Dad said, you ought to go someplace. So that's where I went. Okay. Well, tell us about your college years. And yeah, college years, I was there for Did four. your brother end up going there too? No, he pulled a different catalog off the shelf. And he went to New England College in Henneke, New Hampshire, which was a business, among other things. It was, it was really a small school. It was a business school of some type, and he got a degree out of there. Uh, Marietta was a liberal arts college there with uh, typical, I don't know, it was probably Baptist affiliation, a lot of those in Ohio. So. Uh, I got there, took the train from New York City to Washington, D.C., came across West Virginia with a trunk and a handbag. And that's how I started my career. Picked me up on an old school bus and uh, moved into a men's residence hall, dormitory room there. And uh, what can I say about that? It was a good experience. I enjoyed it. I was did you any, any major in chemistry? How did you Yeah, when you? I was there, it, yeah, that's interesting. How do you? How do you always figure out what you want to be? Because I didn't have, um, somebody said I should take a year of chemistry, you know, as part of your freshman orientation. So sure. I took a year of chemistry, and as is typical the case, I had a real nice professor. His name was E.L. Krause. There were a pair of brothers there who kind of ran the chemistry department. And uh, he was a good teacher and easy to work with. And uh, when I got done with a year of chemistry, he said, you yeah, know, take another year, which was the second year of chemistry. Somebody else was teaching that. Mm -hmm. So I took that, and then by the time I woke up, I had a chemistry degree. So I majored in chemistry and physics. Okay. Uh, and I was a little better student there, but I was not a great student. Uh, I what was campus like? like any, uh, did you join any clubs when you were there? Oh, yeah. I was. Okay. I, actually, I bloomed there. I was a very shy youngster and didn't... Uh, didn't go to parties, didn't date, didn't just kind of work. Dad was a, dad always found work for idle hands, so I had gotten a pretty good mechanical education. I was probably 14. I could do a valve job on your Model A if it needed it, and get it back together and make it run, and so I had that skill set. And uh, so when I got out there, I just took chemistry and physics. I was in student government. I don't know what I was, vice president or something of the class. I was big in fraternity, I was president of that a couple times. And I probably grew socially there, which was probably a really good thing. I used to be a stutterer, so that I started with that but got over that pretty quick. So, uh, and now I can go forever once I get started. What was the ca um, campus like when you were in a there were social events there, and yeah. they have, did they have athletics too? Yeah, they, oh yeah, they had the full program. They had athletics and uh, basketball sure. and football. But I, I was a little, I was a little kid. I wasn't. I, I did play basketball for one year, but I didn't play yeah, much. Right. Uh, that school was growing, and was liberal arts and girls and men. men and yeah, men. I was co-ed, liberal arts, Baptist affiliation, uh, in a typical Midwest town. Marietta's at the conflux of the Ohio River and the Muskingum River. So when they're coming up out of Kentucky uh, after the Revolutionary War, they put a little city there, and that's how that thing was, right on the Ohio. Okay. So uh, it was typical. Uh, I actually liked it there because it was uh, easy to operate. You could walk around. Sure. And after about my second year, I finally figured out I'd worked. I got out of uh, high school in February, so I worked in New York from February to the end of the summer. And, uh, and, and I worked a good bit when I was in uh, uh, high school uh, and even before that as well. So, uh, but that always involved in New York City, that involves a one hour train ride, downtown Manhattan and one hour back, that's two hours a day. And I'd been in Marietta about probably a year and I finally figured out that I could work someplace and live someplace and I wouldn't have to commute two hours a day, which is 10 hours a week. But 
make any sense. <laughs> not today and not then. So I never went back. <clears throat> uh, I did that and I, as I said, I got a degree in chemistry and physics. And I wasn't the best student, but I was getting, I was getting better. Okay. And You're working your way up. I'm working my okay. way up. In the career world. And uh, I had a, uh, another chemistry professor there who came in after I was there about two years. He'd got his PhD from IU. So he was a real chemist. The other two fellows, I later figured out, were, they were okay. They were great teachers, but they weren't researchers or they weren't professional chemists, if you will, in, in the sense that we would use it today. So uh, when I got to be about a senior, he said I ought to think about, since I was a chemistry major, he said I ought to think about getting some more education. And uh, so I sent off some applications to various schools and it's kind of a funny story. I got one offer for a teaching assistantship at Iowa State. And I was pretty well resigned to going to Iowa State. And then late in the spring, I got an offer from Purdue to be a teaching assistant here, come to graduate school. And I think they paid $100 a year more. And I looked at it, it looked like it was about at least three, 400 miles closer to New York. So that's how that choice was made, pure serendipity. I didn't have, wasn't smart enough to know uh, which school might be best or which school might fit me better. Today's, Other factors include today's students got that all psyched out. They know everything about every place with the internet and whatnot. But I, That's right. I didn't know anything about it. So by then I had a car and I packed that with my same suitcase and the same trunk that I came west to Ohio with, threw that in the back of the car and drove out here. Started here in September. Got a little apartment, one room actually, with another fellow over on East Oak Street, 136 East Oak. The house came up for sale a couple of years ago. I thought about buying it, but I didn't. I should have. <laughs> At any rate, I started in and uh, came in and took qualifiers and really found out did what. You take, uh, didn't you take the summer off after you graduated? Did you do anything after No, I worked. I worked those two summers. <clears throat> I oh. used to work up in Cleveland for National Carbon oh, okay. Company. I had a summer job up there in the two summers, my junior and senior summer. Then I worked back in New York in my other two summers. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so I needed, sure. needed to kind of make things work one way or another. Right. Uh, but that's how I got out here. And uh, when I got here, I took our qualifiers in chemistry I probably held up the bottom 30% of that curve. It, 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 it was not good. So I wound up taking quite a few remedial courses and first year and uh, not the best student in the world there either. But I kept getting better as I went along. Um, I did that and uh, did that for about uh, three years. I was working on my master's degree, worked with Walter Edgel. He was a physical chemist at Purdue. Who was the head of the department at that time? Earl McBee. Earl came in the late 40s or early 50s and uh, was head of the chemistry department. And it was interesting. That was an interesting time. I wasn't quite smart enough to realize it then. But uh, research was really just starting. If you go back into the late 40s and early 50s, I got here in 55, 1955. And people were just the university was just thinking about research. They were actually doing some. But in the chemistry department, we'd had fairly active research in the 30s and 40s, but it was all industrial. Just, and Earl McBee was also president of Great Lakes Chemical Company at the time. Did he, he didn't found that company, did he? No, somebody else founded it, but he came along and was director of research. So while he, he was still at Purdue. And then while he was still at Purdue. That eventually led to some problems. But uh, that's, that's a different story. Uh, so that was just the 50s is really when NIH and NSF got started. So we were just beginning to see the influx of, of reasonable amounts of uh, research funding so you could afford to build your department. So the 50s and 60s was a lot of growth on campus, both in funding from the state. In the 60s, you could get 10% in a year raised, because I remember getting one through five. 10%. 10%. Uh, well, 
but you have to realize times were growing there. It's like when people say I made two dollars, or when you say the fees, I always have to jump in because I think of the research. You have to put it in the context of the time in which this was being experienced or done. I'll, I'll put this in context because a teaching assistantship in chemistry at that time was $1,500 a year. That's 10 months appointment, $150 a month. And my take home pay, I remember exactly, was $133.70. What about the tuition? Did you have to pay tuition? No. Oh, they covered tuition. And uh, for $133 a month, I ran my car, had a small room usually with somebody else, and had enough to eat to go to the movies, buy a little gas. Wasn't bad. I, I you could survive. Could survive. Oh, I, I, I was doing better at surviving. I was enjoying that. Yeah. So, uh, and that's. Uh, Did you stay in the same place where you when you first came here? No, I actually moved around. I was 133 East Oak for about a year, and then moved over on State Street. A lot of houses. You know where that church is on the corner of Lutheran Church? There's an empty lot right next to it. That's where I was, right across from the Triple X. I was there for a year, and then I was over on uh, just about a half a block down from Harry's Chocolate Shop there, apartment on the other side. So that's three places I lived. You knew the village. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and there about. I knew the village. Yeah. But it was, I, I mean, it was small then. Purdue was probably, I'd say 10,000 when I came, mm -hmm. something in that range. It was, wasn't. wasn't wasn't as big as it is now. And there wasn't anything to speak of north of the bypass. Hills and dales, and they just opened Indian trails there. But there wasn't anything, wasn't any housing north of 52. So it was, it, you know, it was a lot smaller. And also where the research park is, that was all open country. That was, that was all open all country. Uh, Purdue property, ag, and whatever. And 65 wasn't there, and 52 was the only way to get to Chicago, and that ran right through the middle of Lafayette. <laughs> That's right. Well, the, the, the bypass was in uh, the Sagamore Parkway today, yeah. but uh, it, uh, nothing, nothing beyond that on the other <laughs> side. Okay. Well, tell us then when you finish. What you know, tell us. So I got. Uh, I was working on my master's degree. I just about had that done, and um, somebody came up to me one day and said, "We have a." Oh, I was also teaching, obviously teaching assistantship. I enjoyed that. I think I was good at it. And uh, so I was toying with the idea of maybe being a teacher someplace. And somebody said there is a, they came to me, because uh, I wasn't particularly looking at that time. Uh, they said there's an opening up in Calumet to teach chemistry. At, at that time, it was an extension center. It was a two-year institution. It was not a four-year was, but it was affiliated with Purdue. It was. Oh, it, sure. it, it was Purdue Calumet, but we had a funny name for it. Basically, it was only a two-year program, and then you transferred down uh, to the main campus. And they had two buildings when I got up there. I went up and looked at it. And uh, it was mostly, at that time, commuter campus. And I don't, wasn't a lot of people up there, maybe 1,000 or 1,200 or some number like that. So they needed somebody to teach chemistry up there. And so I taught uh, chemistry 111, 112, and 109 and 110, which is for pharmacy students. The other one was for ag students. And also taught maybe a lab section in 115, 116, which was the engineering chemistry. So, uh, and I did that. Did you live up, did you live up there? I lived both places. Oh, okay. I had a room in Munster. And I had a room down here, and I commuted back and forth. Uh, Were you still taking your studies? I was still studying at the time. I was finishing up my thesis then. And uh, I got $5,000 up there for 10 months. And I thought I was rich. Because that was... A little more money in the pocket. Well, that, I mean, that's a few more expenses, but it was, I mean, it was good money in my, my, my expenses. At any rate, by that time, I had met my future wife. We'd probably been dating... Here at Purdue, you met her? Yeah, okay. I met her at Purdue. I met her, she's four years younger than I am, so I'm starting graduate school 
she's starting undergraduate school. And we used to have uh, office hours when you were teaching. Of course, you had to have posted office hours over in the FWA buildings, which is where most of that was. You remember those, but nobody the else. The permanent temporaries. Yeah, nobody else. That was 1955 when I walked into those. They told me these are temporary buildings. I later was involved when I got along in the chemistry department a little bit later in administrative work. I helped design the 75 building, which was 20 years later, which was the building that replaced them. <laughs> so, so that worked out reasonably. At any rate, I had met Paula, who turned out to be my wife, and I met her the first year I was here. Uh, she was having trouble with chemistry, and if I recall, she failed it. We wouldn't put that up there. The, um, at any rate, uh, she came to office hours. They were looking for help on a course with a girlfriend of hers, who we still know today and visit with uh, a couple times a year. And, uh, but Where was she from? Was she, from she was from a little town south of here called St. Bernice, which is about 15 miles north of Terre Haute on the Illinois line small farm. Her dad was a farmer and a businessman. So we were two totally different, two totally different backgrounds. At any rate, about a year later, we found each other again. Started to date, dated for a year or two there before we got married. So she was down here finishing up her degree and I'm up there teaching. Uh, and those were exciting times because the year I was up there was the year the Russians put up the Sputnik which was 58, and uh, 58, 59, I guess. And that was, uh, that, that, that was kind of a fundamental change because it did two things. It, it pushed science, really pushed it along because the federal government realized that you needed to spend money, which they started to spend even more of. The arms race was going on with the Russians, so there was a lot of activity there. Uh, at any rate, uh, Life is filled with serendipity. <clears throat> so about the time I'm finishing up the year up there, a gentleman on campus here who was in the chemistry department, John Amy, you may know John. Okay, John's been retired for 15, 20 years. Uh, he came up to me one day and said, we have a job opening down here on the campus. Uh, we're looking for someone who is kind of understands chemistry, uh, is good with their hands. We're starting a program where we're trying to help faculty and students learn how to use instrumentation and repair instrumentation and design new instruments. And in other words, help our research program grow to an extent that it hadn't been developed before. And by the time uh, I was also probably interested in getting back to campus here, because Paula was here, so I said, uh, at any rate, I had to interview Earl McBee for that job. And John, who turned out to be my mentor for about 30 years, gave me some great advice when we were doing that. Uh, he said, uh, it's budgeted for $7,000 a year, but ask for $7,500. <laughs> Which is what I did, and I got it. And $500 was a fortune. Uh, so at any rate, uh, I took that job, came back down here, started to work, and we were married the end uh, of that summer, and then she finished up her last year down here, and I took that job over. Funny story with this, at the time I started that job, it had the title of an with rank of instructor, and I didn't realize it at the time, I didn't realize it until almost six or eight years later, but we did not have any administrative professional staff at that time. There was none. There were only two classifications. One was clerical and service staff. The other one was faculty. There was nothing in between. No administrative positions, which gives you some idea uh, of, of how the place operated and, and, and the size of it. So, uh, so when I, uh, and 7,500 was what I was making. 7,500 was outside the range for clerical and service staff. And I wasn't faculty, because I wasn't hired into a faculty slot. I was hired into a, what we would call AP today, but we didn't have it then. So at any rate, uh, about five years later, I finally figured out 
that I'd been there long enough that I had tenure, even though I had never, 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 never came in with a, with even an understanding of tenure and how it operated because I was really just a graduate student at, at, at the time. And uh, so, I, so at any rate, eventually I wound up with tenure for reasons which were just administrative. And, uh, but at any rate, I wasn't on, I wasn't on a tenure track faculty uh, path and I wasn't, I didn't have the responsibilities of a, of a faculty member. So at any rate, I, uh, I spent, by the time I was done, I spent about, I spent the late 50s, all of the 60s, and the 70s up to about 87 in chemistry, about 30 years roughly. Mm -hmm. What about that? Uh, you did, did that conference on molecular structure or mass spect spectroscopy in '67. There was the, there was a, you were involved in NIH got this grant McLafferty. Yeah. And there was a picture in the newspaper that we have the archives and the newspaper stuff up there. You, and I saw that. You actually do your work well. We <laughs> uh, we were always big in mass spectroscopy. Here's what big in mass spectroscopy meant in 1958. We had a mass spectrometer. And in this group that I was working in, I ran that. So I do, I do a little bit about mass spectroscopy. In uh, 1960, Fred McLafferty was here. He left in 65. He came in 60 or 61. We, we, the Department of Chemistry, wanted to get into the mass spectrometry business, which were there's a million people doing it on campus now, but then it was a new field, right. relatively new. So at any rate, we wanted somebody, and we hired Fred McLafferty from Dow Chemical. He was working in Framingham, Massachusetts. We interviewed him and hired him here, and we wanted to get his laboratory set up. And as part of his setup package, we bought him a mass spectrometer, which was a consolidated electrodynamics machine from here to that speaker over there. It cost $110,000. If you can imagine this in 1960 or 61, uh, we were really getting into the big time. And at any rate, Fred came and I worked with Fred and helped set up that machine and train students and do all the things you do with a machine like that. Uh, so that was the first of them. We had Fred McLafferty. 1965, Fred got a better offer and went to Cornell. We looked around for somebody else, and we identified one of the best mass spectroscopists in the world. At that time, it was John Bynum out of England. He worked at ICI over there. We, Joe Foster hired him eventually after a little negotiation, and he moved here. So I just transferred over and worked with him for about three years, every day side by side. Brilliant mind, great mass spectroscopist, and did some really good work along the way uh, with him. And he was here for probably three years. And after about the second year, he was getting kind of lonesome for England because he was an <laughs> Englishman and he traveled back and forth between here and England. Yeah. So that um, we looked around again and uh, Dudley Williams out of England, who was another prominent mass spectroscopist, said, there's a guy you ought to look at. And everybody said, what's his name? This is Greg Cooks. And uh, where is he? Well, he's in Kansas. He was on the faculty at Kansas, maybe there about a year or two. But an up-and-coming fellow, and he'd known Dudley Williams in England after he came from South Africa to England. So at any rate, we eventually, the chemistry department, eventually hired Greg to run that laboratory that was left after John Bynum left. So I got to work with Graham for probably three or four years on a daily basis. Great mind. He's every he's every bit as good yeah, as John good. Byman or Fred. He's done McClellan. a lot. <laughs> he's pretty good. He's got an operation there with forty five people in it currently, with a budget of about two million dollars a year. He's good. He's good. At any rate, I got to work with him for three or four years and we're still very good friends and whatnot. So and my job involved really an odd, an odd combination. I worked with all the faculty in chemistry, helping, helping their research programs. And this was, this was the way research was going. Research was getting to be big time. And you couldn't do everything you wanted to do yourself, so you had to have help. So uh, that's how that went. 
And uh, along the way, I got a good education and lots of lots of good experience too. Uh, lots of fields and. Uh, Probably turned into an analytical or a physical chemist. Probably, probably better described as an analytical chemist, and uh, spent a lot of time working on a lot of different projects, and all the time being working with John Amy and being mentored by him. He was a university is a, as you know, is a hard place to figure out how it operates and where the power points are and how to get things yeah, done. And it changes. And 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 it's constantly changing every day. And John was my mentor, and he was extremely good at that and he shared everything he knew and had me in conversations about how things were done so I, I, I was I was wise beyond my years based on based on the interactions what was his was he on faculty uh, John had a funny position he, he was he on the, the faculty the, uh, Amy Mellon is there a yeah name right with that? Uh, okay. he, he he along with Guy Mellon he okay. sponsored the Amy Mellon Okay. Lecture and there's an Amy instrumentation facility over there named after him. Right. Which is, he I still, is he still alive? He's still alive. Hmm. He's out here in the same house he's always been in. Oh, okay. He's out here in uh, Ravinami, okay. which he developed by himself after he came here as a graduate student. So, uh, and uh, as I went along here, keep, people kept giving me more things to do in the chemistry department, and I. Gradually, in 1978, Dale Marger was uh, elected department head. We usually have a rotating five-year mm -hmm. department headship. And Dale had the brilliant idea that he needed help, so he wanted an assistant head and he wanted an associate head to spread the load out a little bit because he wanted to keep his research program going, which is the model they use in chemistry. And so he asked me if I wanted to be assistant department head. Well, I had never thought about it. I, I knew the whole department. I knew all the people. I knew what their programs were. But I didn't have any experience in administrative. Didn't even really know how you might administer. At that time, about 50 faculty, and whatever the size of the program was. So at any rate, uh, he asked me to be assistant department head, which I was, which got me out of the expertise that I had in an area that I in the lab or whatever. Yeah, that I didn't have. And uh, so I had all the physical facilities I looked after in chemistry. I looked after the freshman chemistry lab, all of our service facilities. I did some budgeting uh, and I got to understand the fiscal operation of a department and mm -hmm. how it works. I spent a lot of time with new faculty coming in probably worked with 25 of our faculty over the years. Help them get set up. And help them get set up, recruit, help them how to operate at Purdue. And our goal was always, the day a new faculty member walked through the door, we wanted to have his lab set up so he could start to work. We didn't want to wait a year, because if you wait a year, you're a year behind on your tenure, <laughs> uh, on your tenure issues. So uh, we did that, and that got me into a lot of different areas within the rest of the university since I, I also wound up doing, uh, when Dale was department head, we had an old building at that time. We didn't have the new building. The new building only came in 75, it came. No, it started in 75, 76. You had Weatherall. Weatherall, yeah, sure. second building. So uh, through that, I got into a lot of other things, uh, which I enjoyed. I got to work at the physical plant a lot understood how that operation works. And uh, Dale would give me projects occasionally, like he would throw me something and say, read this. I said, what is it? He said, it's a new act that was just passed by Congress. It's called the uh, RICRA Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, 1978, which says, among other things, that uh, you have to behave yourself when you take care of your chemicals and when you get rid of them. I will not share with you what happened to those chemicals prior to about 1978. Okay? At any rate, it was done with the standard accepted methods that we used in those days. But you know, that act said you had to do things differently. And he gave me that, and I read it, and uh, it's about 200, 200 plus pages. When I got done reading it, I said, hmm. I said, if they really do all those things, they're going to shut down all chemical synthesis on the campus. I said, we need to do something about that. So I put together a program about 
how you might handle things and comply with that. And about a year and a half later, I still was trying to figure out what to do with that. And I had a good lesson in how the university operates. At the time, Struther Arnott was vice president for research and dean of the graduate school. I forget who he, he, he was probably the first one after Fred Andrews. So at any rate, he I- He came from England. He did, and he, Scotland actually, Scotland, and, he, and he went back. Yes. And he went back and he's now the head of one of the most prestigious, I, I don't know if he still is, but he was head of, I forget which one it is, but it's one of the most prestigious schools I think in Scotland. Uh, at any rate, I talked to him for about a year and a half and told him what the problem was and suggested what ought to be done, and uh, nothing happened. And I finally said, well, this is, we need to do something about this eventually. So at any rate, uh, I figured out another important lesson. I figured out he didn't have any money, which I now know to be true, of course, with the BPR, and I know what, what's in their budgets. So uh, I said, well, that isn't going to work. So I then had a very good idea. We had a brand new fellow came down to campus uh, to head up purchasing. He was just finishing purchasing and moving over the physical plant. Uh, and uh, I contacted him and said, uh, actually sold him a bill of goods, I said, We've got all this, these chemicals that need to be taken care of properly, and we need an organization and whatnot. And this is really just a garbage problem. It's just like picking up the trash. It's the same thing. But originally, everybody wanted to charge for it. I said, if you charge for it, nobody's going to do anything with it. It's going to go the same place it goes now. So at any rate, that was Ken Burns. So Ken was in charge of the physical plant. I went over to see Ken, and uh, he understood the problem instantly. And he had money, because he had all the money in the physical plant. So we eventually put together a program. It was actually Mike Compass and myself and Bob Squires and Joe Alinsky and four or five people on campus. So we started a program and I worked with that for a year or two to get it going. And then the physical plant took it over and still has it. Sure. And that solved that problem. So that's again a valuable lesson in how the And also the way the contacts and things and how to handle it. Explain what really the need is. Yeah. And uh, you've got to get somebody to pick the ball up and run with it. Because right. So, uh, and then I had a lot of fun. I also, the other thing Dale Marjoram had me do was our, uh, our labs were very old. The building was built in 19, the original building was built in about 1923. So it had a good bit of age on it, didn't have adequate air handling systems in it. And uh, almost went the same route as the one I talked about later on, that, that one was first. And, um, I said, we need some money to get a renovation program started. We look around, nobody has any money. It took about four years. We finally went down to the state legislature, convinced them that there was a need, and started our current R&R program, uh, repair and renovation, which is, gets money occasionally now, depending on the budget situation, but at least we got a program started, and that's uh, renovated you know, a lot of an appreciable portion of the program. We now have an active program there, but actually started that just based on the needs out of chemistry and eventually got people to understand what was needed there. But, uh, so I'd worked with the physical plant a good bit there. Then got in got into all sorts of interesting problems. One am I boring you with this? No 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 go ahead. You yeah. Throw out whatever you want. No no no. no. Uh, the um, we had uh, as part of that repair and renovation, one of the big problems... Was that the big start of when they did, didn't have it before that? There was no program before it. We, what we did, our previous mode of operation was we built a laboratory. Whatever we put in it, that was fine. And when we knocked the building down, we replaced it. That was your repair and renovation. There, there were no funds available for repair. Yes, I remember. There was no support. Yeah. So, in other words, now we have money set aside to repair roofs. And right and, and uh, upgrades facilities. We did have a program previous to that. We had a program for classrooms, uh, and we had one for lecture halls, but nobody ever thought you need to do any repair and renovation in a laboratory. So uh, that worked out uh, pretty well. After I got done with repair and renovation, 
what I knew was from, we'd also inventory the whole campus as part of that program to show what the need is. If I remember, my estimate was 30 years and 100 million. It'll take to get, and we probably spent close to 100 million by now. We're not done yet. We're just starting on Lily Hall this past year. And that was about third or fourth in the priority list. That's a huge project, Lily Hall worked. We do that. So at any rate, I then got interested in uh, the problem when you renovate laboratories is you have all these fume hoods in them, and they take about a thousand cubic feet a minute of air in and blow it right out the roof, single pass, and you have to heat it and air condition it. Most of our labs were built with not enough air coming in, so the buildings were under yeah, mi right. mi they mild. Built years ago. Yeah, uh, where where you didn't you weren't near as concerned about health and hygiene and things like that. So I did a little survey and figured out we had, I don't remember at that time, we had probably 87 hoods in our chemistry building. And I looked at it and said, I need about twice this many. And I said, how, how, how are we possibly going to do this? Get twice as many hoods in here. We'll, we won't be able to open the doors in the building because all the air will be go up. So we, uh, I came up with eventually, to make a long story short, I took our fume hoods and I was pretty handy and I had electronics back then and whatnot. So on, on a weekend I got an electrician and we re rewired one of the hoods and made a two-speed hood out of it. And uh, so at night when people went home you just throw, threw a switch and the hood would run about a third speed. So all the air, heated and cooled air that we had, at that time we didn't have much cool air either. Uh, was, was wasted through the building, so from an energy conservation mm -hmm. standpoint. I then figured out and designed two more labs and eventually went over to the physical plant and got Bill Ehlers, Bill Ehlers, who used to be in charge of that. I said, Bill, I can save you a lot of money. I can keep from burning up a lot of coal. Because he had the bill. Part of it is how you, how you fund the university. Physical plants got to give you heat and cooling. And it's, and it's in their budget. So if I could save him, and it turns out I could run the hoods in a, in, in a building for about half the energy load that you had before, if you'd put some capital cost in. And he, uh, he saw the benefit of that pretty quick. He gave me $18,000 and said, why don't you go do a lab, see how it works. So Phil Fuchs at that time was just planning to leave and go to Cleveland. So we had to renovate his laboratories. So I made his a guinea pig situation, that was the first high energy efficient lab that we had on campus. At any rate, I had a lot of good times doing all those things. I would think so, right. In various ways. And my most interesting escapade was Dale Marjoram came to me another day. You know Dottie Murphy? Remember Dottie Murphy? She's the one that worked for Brown. I never met her. I don't think I no, ever met her. No, uh, she, she worked for uh, Department Head of Chemistry. You're thinking of her Brown secretary whose name was Yep. A little um, different. Part of Pope her name, I thought. But Dottie Murphy, I remember. Yeah, I okay. Remember. Well, at any rate, uh, Dottie was supervising secretaries in chemistry. And one day, Dale Marjoram came to me and said, Bill, I want you to supervise the secretaries of chemistry. And I said, Dale, I'm good, but I really don't know anything about that and wouldn't know how to go about that. He said, just do it. <laughs> so at any rate, I did that for, I don't know, a year, a year and a half. Each one of these is a real learning experience because you 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 pick up different wisdom. I I, I understand how to women think a little bit differently than men. <laughs> so that was very. Good. Didn't she handle the uh, thesis checking and thesis formatting at one time too? Mm -hmm. I think she was involved in that. I yeah. That, yeah. She's now retired though. She's oh, uh, Dottie's been retired for yeah. 15, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so at any rate, I that's thirty yeah. years in chemistry and a. And then you moved. To tell me how the technology commercialization came. Well, out. one day, this is all serendipity. One oh, day, uh, we all have it. Bob Greencorn, who at that time was uh, vice president for research and probably dean of the graduate school. And he came to me one day and said, Bill, uh, somebody thinks you would be a good director 
for our Office of Patents and Copyrights, which is in the Purdue Research Foundation. And I, I knew him. I said, Bob, I said, I don't know anything about that. And I really didn't, because it was patents and patenting and license agreements and whatnot. And uh, so, and, and I, I was busy in chemistry at the time. I forget exactly what I was doing there. So I said, no, I'm, I'm, I don't want to do that. And uh, so he went away, and I think he got uh, Bernd Weinberg, I don't know if you remember him, the out of speech and, speech and hearing, got him out of there, and he ran it for about a year. And then he left and went out to Arizona. And Bob came back to me again. He said, I'd really like you to, open I'd really like you to take that job. <laughs> so. Uh, at any rate, we, t we talked around it a little bit, and I finally uh, said I would. And uh, I said, tell me what the job is. And he said, well, screwy job. He said, you'll be half-time in the division of sponsored programs. You'll be associate director there. And you'll be half-time as director of our Office of Patents and Copyrights. So it's a split job, two different, two different jobs. Both of them, as it turned out, bigger than half-time jobs. We, the university's famous for that, as you know. That. So um, I said I'd do that. Now to do that, I had to give up my tenure. But I didn't care because I wasn't using it anyway. And I always figured if I couldn't find a job, my tenure wouldn't be what kept me where I was. <clears throat> so I gave up tenure and went out. Of course, I had a half-time half appointment in PRF, so I couldn't they couldn't get that worked out because I was paid half from university funds and half from PRF funds. At any rate, I went out there and I had an office which was extremely small. Is this at the research park? You out there? No. Oh. I was in uh, ENAD. ENAD, okay. ENAD on the third floor. I remember. I was and there. Uh, yeah, up there by the news service on the back end. <clears throat> and I looked at that thing when I got there and I had one and a half people working for me, and I was half-time. And uh, I don't remember, we had probably 60 disclosures a year, and six or 10 or 15 licenses, something of that order of magnitude, and probably income of maybe a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year at best. Uh, at any rate, I looked at that, and started to see what could be done with that. And first thing, we obviously needed more bodies in there. And after about, I, I worked under those circumstances for about two years, under, A, understanding the business and the two new jobs that I had. And my job in the university was negotiating industrially sponsored research agreements. So I had to negotiate with all the industrial research, and we had a reasonable bid at that time. In fact, we have a lot more today. Uh, and then the other half time I spent doing patent and copyright work, which was interesting because I, again, got to interact with even a bigger circle because now I was working with the whole university as opposed to chemistry. So, uh, uh, so it was a little bit different. And it was also, I was looking at all the technology that comes out of the university, which is really kind of fun because you're it's like, a, like a candy store to play with. Uh, so I did that, and before I was done there, I was there about 12 years. And we built that up, eventually I had, I had, by the time I left, I had probably eight people, maybe nine people. And I got our revenues, and last year I was there, I think we had 2.4 million. So I've taken that from probably a couple of hundred thousand to 2.4 million. And Put a put a much better program, had better record keeping, had had, had a little more orderly uh, process going on there, and enjoyed that. Got to interact with a lot of, again, people across campus, and probably most importantly, it was a time when the research park was changing, and we were also a couple of major accomplishments out there. Purdue is terribly conservative. As you uh, we hate the lead in anything. And one of the trends that was occurring in technology transfer was to license out early stage technology and do startup companies. Uh, and perhaps take an equity interest in the company. 
that was being done on the East Coast and it was being done on the West Coast, but it was not being done in the Midwest and certainly was not being done in Peru. So that was about a two-year project to convince the university that that was a good thing to do. Today, we brag about it daily. We have, I saw the numbers, we have 12 startup companies done last year and we tout the job creation and things that are going on, 100 of them or whatever the number is in the year. There weren't any there in 1995, not zero. In fact, it took two years to convince the university that there might be some merit. And then we finally wrote a book of about 20 or 25 pages, documented what we wanted to do and what good practices across the country were in that area. And I'd have a sit-down meeting with Steve Beering to convince him that this was a good thing to do to allow us to do that. At any rate, uh, he said, yes, I think that's a good idea. So in 1995, we started two companies. One of them is Cook Biotech in the research park, which now probably has 200 people working. The second one is Endosite in the research park, which has, last time I looked, about 80 people in it. Uh, two great examples of what you can do with that. And uh, happen to be lucky, those are the first two. You never get two out of two. So it doesn't happen, there's a pretty high attrition rate. But those happen to be good technologies and we recognize them for what they were. So uh, that, and, and that blended on by the time we got to 2000. Uh, by then, those things like that were accepted and people were uh, more excited about doing it. Uh, but I learned a lot there and that was 12 years. And then... Um, now you, and then technology transfer, but then um, they did a review of things. Now the, uh, yeah, your current position, what you're doing now. Right, okay. Um, I, uh, I had worked for Gary Eisen, who Bob Greencorn was vice president for research, and Gary Eisen was kind of his number one person. And then later on, Gary became uh, vice president for research. But that was, that was quite a bit later. So in the 12 years that I was out at uh, OTC, I reported to Bob Greencorn, but reported through Gary Eisen for the most part. So uh, the university wanted to bring in someone else to run tech transfer. Uh, maybe I wasn't doing a good enough job at that time. At any rate, I, at any rate the university wanted to bring someone to do that. So uh, we did bring in someone really was impressive and uh, very aggressive. She was here about three years. They asked her to leave. But we, 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 we won't get into that. The, uh, so at any rate, uh, Gary said, uh, what would you like to do? Well, I said, well, I, I wouldn't mind coming back. He said, okay. He said, we'll make you a special assistant to the vice president for research. Please write your job description, which I did, and it's the same thing. <laughs> that was. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> and uh, so I came back over, and I didn't know, I understood some of the things the vice president of the research's office did, but didn't understand. Did, you know, just. Let me interject. At that time, the grad school and vice president of research, which used to be one, had been split. Yeah, let's see. That. Um, that's been back and forth about three times. Uh, Strother Arnott, who I mentioned earlier, had both positions. And when Bob Greencorn came along, I what think about he. Ringo. Ringo yeah. only was. No, no, Ringo was provost. But he was also the grad school before he came over to uh, academic uh, over there. He was the dean of the grad school. That's right. Well, and but that also has to do with the question he asked because we kept splitting that. I mean, some th we'd, we'd have them together for a couple of years or one person, and then they decide there was too much work for one person, so they'd split it into two jobs. Uh, at one time, Greencorn had both positions, and he also had just one position. And uh, 
Gary Isom replaced Bob Greencorn, and he had grad school. He had both titles because he he worked half time okay. uh, in in the in the grad school, and then the research, and then the research, and in fact that's how I actually got to meet Struther in nineteen. Uh, I was in a hot air balloon for a while, okay, and I had a balloon. And I, one day, I happened to get over the old Loeb fountain in front of uh, in front of Hubby Hall. Somebody else took a picture of my balloon, and I wound up on the alumni magazine. I got a call from Struther Arnott one day, and he said, uh, "Billy, he said, Bill, I'd like to get a copy of that picture that was on the cover of the alumni magazine." And I said, "Why do you want one, Struther?" He said, it's the only view of campus that shows my three offices. He had one over, he had one in Lilly where he did his science and biological sciences. He had the one down in Young uh, in the graduate school and then, he, and then he was also vice president for research. So I said, okay. That guarantees the picture. Yeah, well, it, 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 well <laughs> but, it, <clears throat> but it goes to your question that we that, that position went back and forth. Back and forth. So Gary had that. And uh, so I worked with Gary, and sure. I worked on conflict of interest and in getting uh, technical and invention reports from faculty. Worked on research development. We, we want to start a center, so I gather some information for him on that. And uh, so that led to the job I currently have, which has been since close to ten years, probably since 1990. And you, uh, you were with Rutledge. Had job oh yeah, okay, right. Gary. Well, no, there's several more in there. Oh, but uh, he was the most recent before Bumpus came. That's right. Uh, Gary left and was replaced eventually by Luis Proenza, and then Luis left to be president of Toledo. No, Akron. Akron. Okay, I keep. I always get the two of them mixed up. Uh, and. Uh, and then after him, uh, we went to, probably went to Chip as, uh, I'm thinking maybe Gary was after Proenza. And then Chip came along with him. That's and right. then they had, and they split. And then they split. Uh, and uh, we've had several, several people down in here. Uh, so at any rate, I've had a lot of fun. A lot of challenges and initiatives. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, you step in and do. You know, something this whole thing is just. Builds up, I, yeah, I mean, it's just an adventure. You just <laughs> go from A to B. Let me ask you. Um, one of the things that you've been involved in was that is BASI, mm -hmm. right? Um, and are you still? How did that come about? Uh, I. You've been connected with them. The newspaper well, actually, I read. the story on BASI is the following. <clears throat> when I was back in chemistry, we were looking for an electrochemist, and people said there's a very good fellow up at Michigan State. We ought to get him down here to Purdue. He's, he's too good for Michigan State. His name's Peter Kissinger. So the department recruited Peter to come down, and I got to know Peter because I was involved in instrumentation then, and he, sure. uh, he was very involved in instrumentation. And Peter, um, at Michigan State, had set up bioanalytical systems as a company and was running it out of his kitchen up in uh, Lansing. And it had probably been going um, maybe two years or a year and a half or some, some, some relatively short period of time when he moved down here. Uh, the company was beginning to show some success, and he needed a building. So he uh, was looking around for a building. Well, first of all, when he moved down here, he had it in his garage, which is out on Loring Avenue out there. So he was out there for a year, year and a half, and then he said he wanted to get a building to go the next step and have a little more room to operate. And my wife, Paula, is in real estate. So to make a long story short, she found him the building at 1205 Kent Avenue, which was a, a kind of consulting and conference building. 
was there. It was about 8,000 square feet, that building, if I remember. And uh, Paula was in real estate, so she was the broker on that arrangement. We got Peter together with the people that were selling the building. And uh, there was a commission came out of that. And we invested that commission in BAS stock. So that, that's how I got associated. Okay. But that, it was in the research park, though. Uh, it or originally it? was in his garage. Here. No, no, but Kent, the, the building was oh, in research. Yeah. Uh, now, it's not the current building. That but the first one, the one the, yeah, that, on Kent. That first one is on Kent. The second right. one is on Kent as well. Okay. So, uh, but that, but that's, that's totally Peter's doing and, and conception and to bring that uh, to fruition. And along the way there, he asked me if I, if I would consider being on the board of directors bringing some wisdom, I'm not sure what. But uh, so uh, I said yes, and uh, as a result of that, that turned out to be about a 30-year adventure. Yes, I know you've been out for a while. There. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I recently gave that up. I'm trying to cut down on some of the things I'm doing. Oh, okay. What about any other um, local, are you any other boards or organizations, local community involved? I've been uh, associated with West Lafayette Economic Development Commission, somebody somebody would be Sonia Marger early in her career asked me if I'd like to be on at that time I was probably probably doing tech transfer this goes back into about it's early 80s 82 or 83 because Sonia was you know was mayor forever 25 20 20 20 something anyway right. But early in her career, she'd asked me if I would like to be on the West Lafayette Economic Development Commission. I've been on there ever since. And that has been a really enjoyable and rewarding in that um, the current strategy for growth in terms of West Lafayette, West Lafayette, as you know, is unusual. There is no industry here. So, I, you know, what are you going to try and grow? Right. But we do have a research park. And as it turns out, that's been the engine for growth. Uh, in West Lafayette, and it, it's perfect synergy because you can draw technology from the university, tech transfer, funnel it to the research park, start companies, hire people. Those people live in West Lafayette, go to school here, pay taxes here, so it really turns the pendulum. Right. Uh, and uh, works out very well. And, and over the years, we've incorporated that into the West Lafayette sure, right, right. Uh, economic development plan, so that was. Uh, that's that's how we got there. Any awards or honors that you'd like to share with us? Oh, uh, yep. You do know. you belong to any professional associations? Uh, connection with the technology at all? Were there any? Yeah, we actually started a group here called Alma Analytical Laboratory Managers Association, which was a group of people who did things like I did in chemistry that I described earlier, but didn't have any professional association to share information with. So about four or five of us, Claude Lucchese from Northwestern and another, another fellow from out in Iowa, got together and just had a little conference, probably had it at Northwestern originally. And the next year we decided we ought to get together someplace else, and I think I hosted either the second or the third one mm -hmm. down here at any rate. We set this group up and chartered it, and uh, it's still the professional society today uh, for laboratory managers. And uh, they're having their next meeting out in California someplace. And I was, I was president of that for a while. Got it started in its, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in its early days. And uh, I've had, you know, I spent a lot of time in the chromatography field and had awards from the Chicago Chromatography Group and other people of that, but those are not yeah. those are not prestigious those awards by the They're not. Every award is nice. How about family? Family? Do you, do you have children? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Paul okay. and I eventually uh, had three children. Okay. Did any come uh, through? We were married, moved over from uh, moved over to Sheet Street, 120 and a half Sheet Street, had an apartment there for about four years on the second floor of a house owned by Mrs. George Stafford, whose son George was police chief for the West Lafayette Police Department for a while, and uh, rented that place for $100 a month, 
turned out to be 95 because I cut the grass for five a month. And at any rate, we lived there for four years after we got out of graduate school. She graduated. Paula then taught out at Otterbin for about five years and commuted back and forth. And uh, then our first child came along, it turned out to be a daughter, uh, Stacy. And then we're on the second floor of an apartment there. She's getting to be about a year old, and this is getting a little tired, walking up and down the stairs where the kids want to go out. And uh, so we thought we ought to have a house. So I looked all over for a house, and eventually turned out the fellow that I had taught chemistry 111 and 112 for, Henry Ritz, Henry and Lois Ritz, was a biochemist uh, in the chemistry department. Uh, he was going to move up to Ferris Institute in Michigan. So he wanted to sell his house, and uh, I knew him, so I talked to him. I said, what do you want for that house? This is a uh, 1,400 square foot on three quarters of an acre, just off the edge of campus, just north of Westwood, up on top of the hill there. I said, what do you want for that? And he said, I want 25,000 for it. I said, well, that's great, except I don't have 25,000, because the bank at that time made you have 25% down, and I didn't have $5,000. I only had about 4,000, and I needed a little bit of that to do something with the house. At any rate, to make a long story short, we finally bought that house from Henry and Lois. It turned out I'd taught for Henry for two years, so we, uh, we knew each other. So bought that house for probably 24000 which today is, you know, here's three quarters of an acre. That's worth about seventy-five today. Right. And the house, and the house. Wise investment. Uh, and, uh, actually, I suffered over that because, again, a great mentor. I was going to buy that house, but I add it up, we now had one daughter, okay. so I, and it, probably another one might have been on the way. No, it wasn't on the way, so I, had, so I had one daughter here, about a year old, and I added up all the income that I had, my salary, and I started at 7500 I told you, this was a couple of years later, so I'm probably making about 8000 and uh, the rule was two and a half times your gross salary, you could afford to pay for a house, and I wouldn't quite get there. So uh, I went to John and I said, John, I'm thinking about doing this, but I'm really, because when I added up all the money I had, I had less than $300 uncommitted for the year among the expenses that I knew about. And I knew, I've got a young kid here, I've got to have a few, right, exactly. a few new expenses. <laughs> so John again gave me some of the best advice they ever had. He said, the thing you don't know is, is that your salary's going to get better. Now we're now back in the early 60s, it's probably 63. So that uh, raises were pretty good at that time, and you know, things looked great. The economy was going good. The department was going good. My career was probably looking pretty good at that point. If I couldn't look at it real well, but he could. And uh, so he said, go ahead. He said, go ahead and do it. Don't worry about it. He said, be the best investment you ever made. And it turned out to be, right? Turned out to me. <laughs> turned out to be. So uh, that was how that came about. And. Uh, we then wound up and had a second child, who's my son, Bill. He's four years older uh, than Stacy. And then we have an old, uh, another boy who's the youngest yet. He's two years older. Okay. And, uh, so did, they, they, did they come to Purdue? They all came to Purdue. Uh -huh. They all did different things. Uh, Where are they, what are they doing now? Well, Stacy uh, <clears throat> got a degree in industrial engineering here originally. Must be 25 years ago now. And uh, she left and worked for DuPont for about 20 years. <clears throat> and then DuPont did some internal changes and sold off their fibers and fabric division and basically furloughed her. Uh, and uh, the company that bought the division that she was in, at that time she was playing with a little development activity within DuPont on smart fabrics. She's fabrics and finishes. So she'd been working on putting wires in cloth so you could make sensors out of it. You could measure various parameters associated with the cloth. Uh, the company that they sold that division to didn't want to have anything to do with that. They were just trying to make fabric and fibers and sell them. So 
uh, they didn't want that at all, so she worked out a deal to buy that division from the company that had bought that from DuPont and also got DuPont to put a little money into it. So they did a startup around that technology. And uh, she worked with that for about two and a half years, got some venture capital people involved, kind of hand them out existence with all the usual problems associated with startup companies. Yeah. And uh, we're about to go bankrupt, and we're trying to get the company sold, and they eventually sold it to Adidas, which was a s sports, and mm -hmm. they were interested in putting sensors into fabrics. And uh, so when they sold the company, uh, she got a three-year contract with Adidas to help them do the transition. She's still working for them now. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> so that worked out sure did. great. And Bill, uh, he got a degree in mechanical engineering. He's the middle child. Got a degree in mechanical engineering technology. And went down to Indianapolis and worked for a machine tool company down near Herco. And currently works for uh, Bemis Paper. He sells shrink wrap. He's a salesperson now. He sells shrink wrap. You know, shrink wrap. Right. Wraps yep. packages on a commercial scale and the machinery that does that. So, and that his background turned out to be pretty good for that. Sure. And Mark, our oldest, uh, our youngest son, uh, he got a degree from Cranard after he was about 25 or 26. But he worked from about 18 to about 26 and eventually started his own company, which was called Sound Lab, which was a, a audio video uh, car stereo type company, did installations as well as uh, retail. And then uh, several years ago, closed the retail business down on that when Circuit City and Best Buy came to town because you couldn't sell any retail against them. And uh, he's now what's called an integrator. He designs systems and he'll install them or have people install them. So if you want audio, video, and screens that go up and down and cameras that take pictures and he can do that. He can do that, and he does it very well. He just got done with a big job down at the Colts practice field. Does he have his own company? Yeah. He does it? Oh, okay. That's what Small he Small company with three right. or four people that'll help him. And uh, I think he put 16 television sets in that complex and put cameras all over the field and have them all work remotely and program them and have the satellites. Oh, marvelous. To do all that stuff. And he, I, he's also on call, and I can't get my remote to work, he'll come over and reprogram that for <laughs> Oh. So. Well, we'll leave it up to you. To, is there something that I, would you like that I forgot to ask or anything that... Well, you know, I don't know. I've always, you uh, you know... You, what you are your game plans? What are my game plans? Right. Well, uh, I'm reaching the standpoint here where I probably ought to slow down a little bit. Uh, and I'm thinking about retiring eventually. But I've been saying that for about four or five years. And uh, I enjoy working. I enjoy the people at Purdue, which is probably what keeps you okay. keeps you going and uh, also keeps your mind stimulated. Uh, I'm still pretty sharp, and I still read a lot of journals, and I think I have a pretty broad knowledge uh, in a lot of areas. I do a lot of jobs now, which are which are one-off jobs. People either don't know what to do with them or they don't seem soluble or somebody needs to be taken care of. So I'll, I'll usually get quite a few of those jobs, sometimes three or four a day. They may be an hour, they may be 10 minutes, or they may be a week or two. So, uh, uh, but I enjoy all of that. All of that. And uh, I still get a kick out of coming to work. So that's been, that's been my 55 year saga here. That's pretty good. How about a favorite? Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? A favorite Purdue tradition? Well, they've done away with most of them. Well, those are okay. I, I mean, mean, we I no longer we no we no longer have cords for seniors. We did have Paula's fiftieth uh, year reunion. We celebrated last year. She's four years younger than I am, so we celebrated that last year, and had uh, four of her roommates come in and join us, and Paula still has her cord skirt, which she took to the dressmaker, who put about maybe eight or ten inches in it, I don't know how much, by the way, she wore that. <laughs> so, 
We uh, got one of those one time in the archives years ago, and Kathy Potter said, Katie, why don't you try that on? I said, I don't think so. You know, I don't think <laughs> I want to try it. I wasn't sure about cleaning Well, we it. used to, uh, when we were dating, she had, this would be her senior year, she had that skirt on, and we were victory variety shows, which you recall. Used to bring in super super shows, and they were only a dollar or two at that time. And we're walking through the Union, and coming this way is Victor Borgia, who was performing, performing Friday right, okay. or Saturday, or both days probably. Yeah, they did both days. And uh, Paula stops him, introduces herself, and gets him to autograph her skirt. So we still have that on this skirt, which was worn <laughs> last year. So. Uh, I, 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 now, I was a graduate student here, so I did not get into the traditional undergraduate traditions. So uh, I'm, I'm a little weak on <laughs> Purdue traditions. You know, you go to Baltimore. What about an outstanding event? That's something that comes to mind. You shared some that, I think. A lot of serendipity things that have come to mind, which you shared already. Outstanding events. Well, chemistry, I spent a long time there. It always... Uh, outstanding event was probably I was assistant department head when Herb Brown got his Nobel Prize. That was pretty exciting for the department. Exciting for me as well. I always enjoyed Herb. And I, I uh, could visit him anytime. Herb was always very easy to approach. And he would have problems occasionally and I'd give him a hand with it. Uh, and he, uh, I also had Herb as a teacher. He was a great teacher. I had 641 and 642 as our uh, inorganic chemistry course. Great teacher. So him, him getting an Nobel Prize probably meant a little more to me. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. And uh, just that he was a great guy because I, when I retired from chemistry, he gave me a little party. Herb couldn't make the party, but he did take the time. He took one of his textbooks and autographed it from Sarah and him and gave it to him. I still have it on still have it on my bookshelf so he was a, he was just a good fellow right. and there's all kind of good people like that people who just make an impression on you and you, uh, and you enjoy working with them so, right. so a lot That's of made it yeah very you know still have a lot of good friends there all right and, uh, see that any closing comments or anything that uh, you want to I'll leave it up to you anything probably special? go boilers okay sounds good to me thank you Bill, very much <laughs> thank you <laughs> thank you